it's very much engaging with that virtual world now. And I think from a volunteer management perspective, the one benefit I've very much seen over the past seven months is the buy into technology now from a wider age range and a wider demographic. I think from an administrative point of view, it's knowing that actually virtual does work and virtual can be engaging as long as you plan carefully. But from a volunteer perspective as well, I think there's a lot more buy into technology now. And we always look at age group. I don't think people should be afraid of planning something online, planning something virtually, because now, after the past seven months, people haven't got used to Zoom and got used to Teams and got used to joining a meeting or FaceTiming somebody to talk to them. So actually, why not continue that? Meet Tom Balkett, a specialist freelancer in volunteer and workforce management. Recorded in amongst the thick of UK COVID lockdowns, 2020 presented its fair share of challenges for a freelancer who specialises in events. While many would dwell on a tough year, Tom shines with optimism about the future and how important events and volunteering will be in uniting communities. In this episode of the podcast, we learn more about the world of freelancing. From major sporting events to arts and cultural festivals, Tom has experienced the full remit of events and understands just how powerful people including volunteers, are in creating memorable experiences. After a year of lockdowns and isolations, we discuss the renewed reliance on technology and how this has positively impacted workforce programs worldwide, including what this means for the future of volunteering. Tom and I also discuss the importance of placing value on volunteers to ensure maximum engagement and retention. This podcast was recorded remotely, so we do apologize for the broken audio at times. Here's hoping that these podcasts can be recorded in person sooner rather than later. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Tom Balkett, mate, thank you so much for joining us on the Engaged Volunteer Podcast. Joining us today from sunny Birmingham. How are you, mate? Yeah, very well, thank you. All good. It's been an odd year, but you know, we're getting <laughs> through it and uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. I am very much of that philosophy. Good man, good man. Mate, give, uh, give the listeners a little uh, preview of, of what you're up to at the moment. I really admire your journey and we're going to get into about the freelance work you've been up to, but you've been keeping yourself busy with a bit of running lines this year. Is that right? Yeah, so uh, as well as event work, I do run the line in the National League, which is the uh, league below the English Football League over here. Yep. So uh, that's kept me busy once we restarted the season. Not having many events has uh, given me time to do a lot of games, which is good. So keeping the fitness up as well, which is which is helpful. Good man. So being screamed at from angry strikers and, and coaches on the sideline, I presume. Oh, very much so. Just There's just no spectators at the moment, which is a different oh, that's good. remit as well. Um, <laughs> so yes, we'll get them do. back soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, nice, mate. So you've been able to uh, keep yourself busy with a bit of refing until the events and your contracting picks up again. Is that right? Yeah, totally that. So quiet, quiet summer in terms of 2020, as I'm sure a lot of people have had. Very much so. But now starting to look towards 2021 and things starting to appear on the horizon, which is nice to see. Fantastic, mate. So we'll dive into it a bit. Just give it the listeners a little bit of a summary of sort of what your role is as a contractor and managing workforce and a bit about how you got there. Yeah, no worries. So I sort of brand myself as a freelance event and workforce manager. Um, awesome. I've been doing that since 2018. So I started in events fresh out of uni onto an arts festival as an internship. I had no direct interest or expectation to end up working in events. It just sort of happened and then I've never left, which has mm-hmm. been nice. Very yep. much the industry for me is about the variety and that's sort of how I've continued through it. So I've had roles that have gone for 12 months, 18 months, two years, um, specifically around athletics when I worked at Sport England for a while. Um, sure. But then since 2018, I've been picking up those freelance contracts, very much my own decision, wanting a bit of variety. I also have quite a wide span in terms of interest. So sport is my main, but I'm also very interested in the art. That's sort of my degree background. So freelancing actually gives me a chance to be involved in both of, both of those remits and, and those events. So. I work at festivals, I work at gigs, I do do a lot of work on major sports events. So at the moment, for example, starting to think about next year, working on triathlon, working on boxing, working on athletics again, but also hoping that the festival season manages to restart and getting back into some muddy fields come summer, which is always an interesting little beast. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, are you able to do all of this sort of from home or are you in offices for those three, as an example, those three organisations? 
Um, so I do do a lot of work from home. So I think the one benefit for me is this year hasn't been too different in terms yeah. of what I've been used to for the past few years. Working from home is a big thing, but normally I try and balance that with going and spending some time with those organisations in the office, mainly to get to know the teams, but also it's a change of sort of environment and a bit of variety for myself, if I'm honest. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, sense. very similar with site visits and things like that. Haven't been able to do any of those this year, but hopefully mm-hmm. they will appear again. But yes. yeah, the work from home thing is something I am I am well versed in, shall we say? <laughs> Good man, nice one. So next year seems to be picking up. What is the vibe you're you're seeing over there in the UK? Obviously tough going into lockdown at the moment as we talk in December or or maybe just coming out of it. What's the scenario over there at the moment? As of today, we are out of a lockdown and in a tiered system. So we're in three tiers, three being the highest, which is very high, two being high and one being medium. The majority of the country is in high or very high, which basically means no real social interaction with anyone outside your household. If it is, it has to be outdoors. Tier three itself also means closure of things such as arts venues, which is obviously still having an impact within the events world. Of course. The one biggest downfall for us in terms of events was the original plan in terms of the comeback after the first lockdown. Events was very much in the last part of that, in the original plan of October. So events, mm-hmm. conferences, meetings could restart. And actually, we never got to that. Sure. The situation sure. got worse. And then we ended up having a second lockdown. But yeah. Today is the day whereby, you know, we're sort of a little bit happier. Yesterday, the first vaccine was administered to someone in the UK. So mm-hmm. that, that's a positive thing. And I think that has sort of started people thinking now that actually next year might be possible in terms of delivery. So yeah. And you're starting to, to see that turn around, like triathlon, boxing, athletics. These are major events you're talking about that are coming back in 2021, is it, or 2022? Yeah, so 2021, I think... What we've had right. confirmed already is the fact that events will happen, be they behind closed doors or with spectators. So yeah. I think there are certain things that now they go, we can function, but we may not yeah. be able to function with people paying to actually come and see and functioning within a COVID secure environment, which is changing mm-hmm. our remit very massively, especially within the workforce world in terms of numbers, requirements, specifications, guidelines, which is an interesting thing actually looking at it and how each organisation looks at it from that perspective. But then there is sort of hope later down the line, actually, that we could actually do some events with spectators, be that late summer, middle of summer, if we actually get to a point where people are vaccinated and actually that's an acceptable thing to do within the guidelines but it just means everything has to have a rather flexible plan at the moment got it got it and so from a workforce perspective and volunteers are you seeing planning for reduced numbers because there's going to be less people to interact with and and sort of effectively guide around the the event yeah so it's a bit of an odd one actually and i'll use boxing and triathlon as two polar opposites of this Mm -hmm. so and so tom when, when you say triathlon and boxing is it what events are they A very good point. So boxing is Boxing Road to Tokyo. So that's the Olympic qualifying tournament. So I work on the European leg of that, which was stopped in March. It was the last event in the UK to carry on when COVID started appearing and we stopped. We were actually the last one to stop. So it's a continuation of that from where we stopped. Triathlon is the AJ Bell 2021 World Triathlon Series. So it's a yearly event, part of the World Triathlon Series. Next year's also got a para series event as well. So that's in Leeds. And that's June. So boxing's in April, tw- towards the end of April and triathlon is in June. Nice one. Um, yeah. So in terms of remit, it's, it is interesting because boxing is in an indoor space. And the remit at the moment very much is, from a workforce perspective, the minimum amount of people to deliver the event and behind closed doors. Sure. But within that, we have to have a contingency plan of if we had spectators, who else would we need? Mm-hmm. And then can we include a volunteer program to engage with the people who were volunteering originally when the event was happening because we really don't want to lose them but then also what roles can they undertake that are additional and worthwhile but at the same time not necessarily essential Mm -hmm. triathlon actually having looked through the specification a couple of times now there are probably more volunteers required for triathlon than in the previous version interesting and that's because of the way the site is set up because of what we think covid guidelines may be that actually there are other elements of the event that we need to consider and we may need to populate with people but also we want to make sure that within that remit people are looked after properly 
Sure. And, that and people being, being, oh, sorry, you were going to say people, but I'm presuming athletes and people coming to watch. Yeah, exactly. So again, sure. there's a stage plan with that in terms of whether it's behind closed doors, whether the spectators yep. and that will all be worked out within guidelines. But again, it's actually looking after the volunteers and making sure that, you know, they are COVID compliant with what we need, but also that actually that may put extra pressure on them in terms of roles and functionality. So we give them shorter shifts, longer breaks, and actually we're managing that a little bit more proactively than perhaps we have been in the past. Yes, I understand. Yeah, okay. Interesting. So you're seeing uh, a reduction potentially, but also maybe an increase. So it's probably difficult for a consistency there for, for people listening to go, oh, we're looking at this for, for 2021, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's the big thing. I think, you know, the, the world of events, nothing is necessarily the same, even if you do the same event twice. Of course. Um, I, I very much always fall into that mantra, but I don't think you can compare one and one necessarily no. in terms of remit and structure and requirement yet. Um, because also people have very, very different interpretations of whether they will volunteer or not. And I think that's something nobody quite knows yet in terms of... Yeah. There will be a lot of people that want to come back and volunteer, but there will be certain people that go, I'm still not comfortable in that environment. And we have to plan for that, but also, you know, know that that's perfectly acceptable from our point of view. Mm. What are you in that situation? Let's say you're going back out to your volunteers for the triathlon and you're getting a lot of people saying, I'm not really comfortable or confident to come back. Have you started thinking about what you're going to do to entice and effectively to sell to volunteers to say, we're going to look after you? Have you started thinking about what you can do to look after them? Yeah. So I think very much for me has been, and the policy for me is very open and honest in terms of what they're doing and what the expectation is. I do not fall into the category of trying to mold a role to something that it will never be. Um, I think you can sometimes oversell what a volunteer role will be. Um, so it is being very open and honest about that from the start. I think the big thing for me in terms of going out for recruitment is also being very honest in terms of at this point, triathlon, for example, is in seven months time. We do not know what the regulations will be then. And we do not know the requirements. Sure. So there needs to be an element of flexibility from you agreeing to sign up, but also us on our expectations of you Mm -hmm. and, I've put in a commitment that we will keep volunteers updated on a monthly basis as to what our thinking is. And then if they're not comfortable at that point, we can have a conversation about it. I very much fall into the don't make a decision now because nobody knows what it will be like in six months time. Of course. Are you starting to think about online training and induction for COVID safe, um, you know, reasons, this sort of thing? I'm sure you, I'm sure you're all across it. Yeah, very much so. So um, the plan at the moment for, for all events really is where training is required, it will all be virtual, it will be done online as a module. There will be no in-person training unless it's a necessity, i.e. an access issue, and then we will sure. facilitate it with no issue. Very much in terms of similar in terms of PPE and things like that, in terms of requirement, if there's a necessity for it, we will facilitate that. That's not a problem. But yeah, it's very much engaging with that virtual world now. And I think from a volunteer management perspective, the one benefit I've very much seen over the past seven months is the buy into technology now from a wider age range and a wider demographic on both the administrator and the volunteer side. Yeah, very, very much so. So I think from an administrator point of view, it's knowing that actually virtual does work and virtual can be engaging as long as you plan carefully. But Mm -hmm. from a volunteer perspective as well, I think there's a lot more buy into technology now. And we always look at age groups and age demographic, but I think that actually now spans that wider age demographic. And I I don't think people should be afraid of planning something online, planning something virtually, because now after the past seven months, people have got used to Zoom and got used to Teams and got used to joining a meeting or FaceTiming somebody to talk to them. So actually, why not continue that? Yeah, I agree. It's actually just a quick one on that is it's always been a, a fine fine balance of mass workforce management and personalization. And this is yeah. technology sits somewhere in between. And I see both point of views of saying, I need to look my volunteers in the eyes. I need to know who they are, every single one of them. But when you have, like, uh, how many volunteers we have for the triathlon, as an example? The triathlon, you're looking at sort of 250 250 odd a day so that yeah. over, over two three days at least that could be different people over different days the same people again and again and again from, from very different areas yeah so you're expecting probably 500 plus individuals sort of involved in the process that 
it's very difficult for you to personally know and communicate individually with every single one of them. And that's where technology plays its part to ensure that they are communicated to. Do you have an opinion on that or like a, an experience of good or bad with technology for mass communication and the balance of personalization too? Yeah, I think that's really, really important. I think from, from our understanding as well, I think we need to go in with that mindset in terms of if you're running a large volunteer program, you're not going to be able to know everybody personally. And, you know, that is part and parcel. I've always worked in environments and worked with people who will say that I'm a bit odd in terms of tell me a name and I can probably tell you what shift they're doing and what role they're doing because that's just yeah. how my brain works. Yeah. But I probably couldn't tell you what their face looked like it's sort of a really odd thing and I think people have different skill sets and I very much always try and work with people when I build volunteer management teams that will marry up with that that will know faces that have different skills and attributes but I think as well working for me with that sort of remit is there has been a lot more buy into tech and I use triathlon in leaders as a prime example so 2019 was the first time we used text reminders for everybody for shifts mm -hmm. so you know everybody got a text the day before to say this is your shift and you know people are like, oh this is great you know i don't even need to think about what i'm totally. doing i've been texted and told what i'm doing so no there matter is the age group now. or demographic because everyone's text messaging exactly and i think that's the big thing in terms of knowing where you can get easy buy-in from people with tech mm -hmm. don't put it out as something that's big and scary because it really isn't and i think a big thing for me even building applications make them as simplistic as possible even if they are using sophisticated technology Mm -hmm. The back end yeah. that you see can be as complicated as you want and you're comfortable with, but front, front facing for volunteers, make it simple. Totally. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. And, and, and put it on a silver platter. Um, I think it's yeah. just, they're, they're giving up their time. Don't make them give up triple the amount of time just in order to, to jump through hoops to, to do it. Exactly. Yeah, that. Can. It, <laughs> exactly that. And I think the other thing with that on, on applications is include information that you're going to need and use. Don't think about, Oh, I need this question. I need reams and reams and reams. And actually you're never probably going to look at. Yeah. Very good point. I think that's, the, the, hopefully the death of the bulk PDF briefing that's 30 pages long. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gene, it's slow death, but I'm hoping it's coming quickly now. It's just, <laughs> just about personalizing and making it relevant for the specific roles people are playing. And I hope that soon enough you, you mentioned the online training element too, about shift training, shift specific training instead of reading i understand sometimes there's resource and time that goes into this too but maybe the more major event side and, and major charity side perhaps um for specific roles you only need to build these um, specific role trainings out once and then you have them forever right so um that's something i really would love to see as a hopefully an outcome of COVID in a positive sense i think that's a really really good point and i think the the, the buy-in for that as well is the sustainability aspect now that is so massive totally. within the events remit but actually, it's a really easy win for us. You know, do you need a paper handbook for everybody? No, you don't. Do it digitally. Do it on an app. Do it virtually. You know, buy into that sustainability factor. That's so important now. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, incredibly. We could talk for a long time about <laughs> sustainability of events and, and not just the workforce side, but everything. It's a changing landscape at the moment. Now, yeah. Tom, I, I'm really interested in, in the journey you've created for yourself. I, I really respect the, the journey you've taken and the positive attitude that you bring with it so for any sort of volunteer manager out there how do you go about i guess having the confidence probably firstly and in, in taking the leap of not maybe having the secured nine to five job and trying to win ultimately win and sell yourself to organizations to say that i'm the man to or, or woman to look after your program yeah i think that's a really really good question and i often get it banded at me that freelancing is a lot about who you know not necessarily what you know and to some degree that is 100 mm -hmm. yeah. percent correct it is. We don't shy away from that. But it also does take a lot of effort and a lot of work to actually find Cre opportunities. Create who you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. exactly. What you know creates who you know, yeah. Exactly that. And it, it, is, it is that balance of both in terms of, especially in a realm that you're confident in and you know you have the skill set in. But then actually, once you dig into the specifics, it's something very different. And that's the remit I've always gone down in terms of you take away all the shiny stuff about what an event actually is. There are always the basics of an event and the basic roles that have to operate for that event sure. to function, no matter what it is. And one of them will always be around workforce management. And I think once you detach the specific sport or the specific art element or the specific cultural element, they run very, very similar in terms of how they're set up. And sometimes you just need to have that 
the ability to sell what that is without the the fancy stuff around it and the importance of it. Makes and sense. for me, I always go in with the caveat of people make an experience, people make an event, be that staff, be that volunteers, be it spectators. Without any of those three, events don't happen and events don't function the way that you would want them to function. Well, 2020 has been strange for that, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. And it, it's proved a point in terms of people have missed things like festivals, like going to football matches, like going to gigs, like going to stadiums. And there's been such a will and campaign of getting fans back in. And that's a prime example of it. I think yeah. for me, in terms of going about opportunities, I very much fall into the category of know what's coming up. So I will be thinking about now 2022, 2023 in terms of major sports events Mm -hmm. major gigs you know festivals in terms of what might be on the horizon so that you can actually start thinking about them in advance Mm -hmm. and then knowing how they're going to be delivered who they're delivered by but then also knowing your own worth for me is very very important in terms of what can you offer within Mm -hmm. that role Mm -hmm. and there are certain roles that I will happily do that aren't necessarily within the specifics of my skill set because it balances out with what I enjoy and what I know I'm good at. And within the freelancing world, it is that mix of you apply for certain jobs like you would with anything else. It's a temporary contract. Some of it will be you've worked with somebody on a past event, another event comes up and there's a role that needs doing and you fit it. So you have a conversation about it. Yep. And it's getting that balance for me is a big, big thing. I think the sort of events I work on, are all normally within a very similar time period. I'll be very honest in terms of delivery. So from sort of May to September, my diary goes back to back and I don't stop. And it's about getting the balance right for what you want to do, what you need to do financially, to be honest. Mm -hmm, Um, Of course. But then also what might benefit you a little bit further down the line as well. Makes sense. Yeah, incredible. So you've got a calendar now for the next three years. And are you actively sitting there reaching out to those people or through your network to say, hey, you know, could I get an introduction to this person because, hey, the, the 2023 event's coming up and I think I could add value? Is you genuinely doing outreach for that purpose or, or sort of hoping that things come through to you now? I very much fall into the outreach category in terms of yeah, making great. your own opportunity. Fantastic. I think that's the best thing to do. Fantastic. Um, and because the worst that can happen is they say no, but then yeah. you haven't tried and you're never going to know. And that for me is really, really important of actually banging on that door because there are some door, you know, some opportunities I've had over the past two years that I never would have thought would have actually come to light. And they have. I think one of the other things for me is workforce management and volunteer management is my speciality. And that's what I've been doing for the past nine, 10 years. But my freelance work, I balance that with other things. So I do a lot of ticketing operations. I do a lot of event control management. I do a lot of spectator services work because I've always fallen into that liking variety. And I am more than happy to rock up at a gig and work a gig in ticketing for one day as a nice change than running a volunteer program through process planning delivery for six months. Yep, I understand. Uh, Good to have that flexibility of skill set for you and I guess a a mind refresh probably from the day to day. Yeah. For for those listening, like it can be tough, right? Sitting back and reaching out to someone you've never met before. Like any advice for those people being like, just need to take the plunge? So I very much did that in 2018. So I finished an 18-month contract on an athletics event and was like, what am I going to do now? And I could have happily sat and looked for more jobs that were more long-term, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to give freelancing a go. And yeah, it's hard at first. It definitely is. But you'll already know people from events that you've worked on in the past and that experience. And I also very much fall into the volunteer at events look to help out where you can ask if there's anything you can do just to get those contacts people say it's about gaining event experience and yes 100 percent it is but it also gets you to know the people Mm. and if you do a good job people do genuinely come back to you that's how it works Um, a good point you know i also don't fall into the category of i haven't done an event management degree I did a drama and English degree at uni and totally fell into events by accident. But mm-hmm. 10 years later, I'm still doing it because yeah. I love it, but also because it's, it built my skill set. So yeah. don't think that you're tied down by, I don't have an event background. Or if I do have an event background and I can't find the opportunity, just think mm. about actually, is there something I could do that's similar that might actually mm. benefit me a little later down the line? And never be afraid of asking people. I think, yeah. especially in the world we're in at the moment, which has been a hideous 2020 and so many longer term opportunities and permanent roles no longer exist because companies just financially haven't survived. Events will come back 
and people will want to attend events. So actually, from a freelance perspective, 2021 and 2022 could be very rich in terms of opportunity. Mm, interesting insight, mate. That's really, really great. I appreciate um, that. And hopefully people listening will, will get a bit out of that as well. Are you, you uh, just to touch on something before, like the events are wanting to come back. What is your initial gut feel on volunteers wanting to come back? I know we've kind of touched on it a little, but from your early indications, do you think people are keen to volunteer or is there a lot of nervousness, especially in the UK? I think it's a combination of things. I think volunteers traditionally fall into that category of wanting to volunteer at many things and they will have had a very quiet year. So I think there definitely is a will to get back into things, but I think there will need to be precautions and traditionally events that, I will work on as a workforce sort of volunteers generally and this is not a very general rule fall into sort of the categories of your students your younger people who volunteer for experience or older people who have more time and then the people who want to actually volunteer at the specific event it is so they like the sport they're part of the area and I think that as a demographic is very interesting in terms of obviously the older age group is more COVID high risk but I actually think people will want to return. And I think Mm -hmm. it's really important for us from a workforce management point of view to get that balance right in terms of finding opportunities people are welcome to come and do and can engage with and letting them make that decision. You know, we need to make sure that it's built into safety plans and regulations and however we run an event because people will want to come. And I think we need to make sure that we're treating everybody in a very, very similar way. That's really, really important from my point of view. I think very, very similarly with not wanting to return, we have to go, yeah, that's totally understandable. It's a totally different situation. There will be Mm -hmm. people that won't be comfortable working on events. There'll be people that won't be comfortable participating in events. And that's absolutely fine. And I think we just need to be very upfront with that when we're asking for volunteers that if you're not comfortable, that's absolutely fine by us. Got it. Yeah. Good insight, mate. And you, you, you mentioned there about the consistent message for those groups. I, I think, and you tell me, but there probably needs to be a balance though of a direct message to certain groups because university students might be like, game on, I'm back in, no worries, we've got a vaccination, but older demographics perhaps might be a bit more reserved. So do you then have different messages to different groups? I think you have to be careful of doing that. I think the way yeah. that I would break yeah, very much next year is being very honest with where you are in terms yeah. of for the next six, seven, eight months, it's going to be very fluid and things will keep changing. And at the moment, I can't tell you what our COVID regulations are going to be for, sure. for an event that's in June. I may not be able to tell you that in April because it's just going to constantly change. So for me, it's that communication tool and sort of that monthly update in terms of this is where we're currently at. If there's any issue, let us know. Tell us what you're thinking and having that constant engagement Mm -hmm. because that for me then puts the emphasis back on people if they think there is an issue or they're not comfortable to tell us rather than us assume there's going to be an issue when there might not be. Yeah, yeah, I understand. No worries. All right, mate, I'm keen to jump over now. We discussed before we jumped on here about getting staff buy-in. So it's obviously the workforce and volunteer manager, but the ultimate success of the program is often dependent on not just yourself. It's dependent on all of your colleagues and those that are probably managing the volunteers on the day because you're not hands-on with the 300 at the triathlon every single day. Um, it's kind of you've done your job and then it's fingers crossed they, they get a great experience from those that are managing them, right? So talk to me a bit about making sure that executional piece, is, that last step of the run is, is completed well. Yeah, so for me, it's a really, really big thing to have staff buy into your volunteer program. And that's not just on the day in terms of turning up and having a pool of volunteers and off you go and use them how you need. This sort of started for me back in 2016, planning the volunteer program for World Indoor Athletics Championships. And my ethos very much for that was, if you request volunteers, you need to know why you need them, how you're going to use them. But then you also need to understand the process they have to go through to be part of this especially with a major event where you run recruitment you do appraisals of applications you run selection centers so we actually got staff buy-in from loc staff and some of the event delivery staff to come and do some of the selection centers and actually appraise the volunteer selection centers which was really really useful because they got an understanding of how they worked and how much volunteers wanted to be involved but also the process they go through 
You sure. know, they don't just apply and turn up on the day. There are so many different steps. I think sometimes people don't understand and they don't understand the commitment that people buy in to actually an opportunity that they're not getting paid for and they're giving up a lot of time to benefit you and the delivery of an event. And it's very, very similar for me with, with other events in terms of I will always have conversations with LOC leads, um, organising committee staff that think they need volunteers to talk through what will that volunteer actually specifically be doing is that of benefit to the event? Is it of benefit to you? And is it of benefit to them? Because sometimes we can overly try and not cover up is the wrong word, but we can try and make something seem some, that it's something it's not, shall we say. I get it. Um, and I get I'm it. always very open and honest in terms of that, in terms of what a volunteer opportunity is. If somebody's going to be controlling an access point for eight hours and that's their role and they'll be standing mm-hmm. there, tell them that that's what it's going to be. And nine times mm-hmm. out of 10, I'll go, yeah, that's fine. I'll buy into it tell them something else and then that's what they end up doing you get a very different reaction so it's all about that open and honest approach for me and Mm. event day staff is a very very similar perspective in terms of when they turn up they know the event but actually use the volunteers while Mm. they're there very good point let's find them things to do don't just get them there because you needed them and then oh game over i'm gonna have my coffee now because my numbers turned up Exactly. And this is what happens in terms of, and it does happen sometimes in terms of that sort of, it, it's an interesting one, yeah. isn't it? Because we always try and overstaff for, to, for dropout, but then if everybody turns up, what do you do? And it's getting that balance right. And it's getting staff buying for me in terms of what the volunteers are there for, what they can benefit for. And I think the other thing for me is, especially a lot of events that I run, you get a lot of volunteers that know the sport very well. So at triathlon, we get a lot of volunteers that have a lot of triathlon experience or volunteered that event for five, six years. Athletics, you get people coming back again and again and again and again. So they actually know what they're doing. So let's not try and be autonomous in what we do. Mm. They may know the event better than you. The first year I worked triathlon, <laughs> the training session that we delivered, the volunteers could have told me more than I actually delivered in it without them who works with me. And that's absolutely yes. fine. Shut up, Tom. Because basically, <laughs> this is how it works. But, yeah. you know, and it's very, very important to have that buy-in for me in terms of an understanding. I think it is sometimes missed in terms of actually understanding how a volunteer program at a major event works and how much effort is put into it by volunteers in terms of getting mm. through applications, getting to selections, shifting, uniforms, training. It's not just I filled in a form online and then I turned up on the day. Yeah, very good point, mate. Very good point. And I think that to your point about the buy-in, I know I've referenced this podcast a lot that we've done, but with Tammy Richter from South by Southwest, major event, technology, music event in Texas, humongous volunteer program. And she talks about the volunteers that come from all over the world and all over the States to come a volunteer yeah. and incredible different perspectives and knowledge and other volunteer programs have done. Like it's just an incredible pool of knowledge that you could, you know, learn a lot from. Or you could turn a blind eye and just sort of go, I need to get 3,000 people a day. I'm just going to get them there and then I sort of wash my hands of it. So how do you balance that sort of engaging with volunteers through the process to make sure you're learning enough and allowing them to influence the program compared to Tom Bowkett's volunteer program? (laughs) I think a prime example of this is, being freelance and doing a lot of events that I don't have any knowledge about, sometimes it is very volunteer-led. So sure. triathlon being an example of that. The first year we did triathlon, I went in and went, yeah, everybody's got to come to a training session. Well, actually, we did a training session and most of the people there knew all the information because they volunteered for four years in a row before it. So mm-hmm. then the next year we go back and go, okay, you only need to come to a training session if you haven't volunteered or if you want sure. to. It, it's getting that balance is very, very important for me in terms of events that happen again and again and again, have the same people again and again and again, especially from a volunteer perspective, it will. And I always try and get that married up with new people. I think it's important that, you know, your workforce is sort of split 60 40 in terms of experience and sort of new people so that you've got that turnover and you've got that freshness is important but then whilst they're there pair them up let an experienced person pair up with a new person let them tell them about what the event is don't try and think that we're there to tell them how to do their role i think that's a big thing we're there to assist them in the role but actually if they know the role and it's the same that they've done in the past let them run with that because Mm -hmm. they're going to know it and know how to do it and probably add more to it than you ever could Mm. i think that sort of management side of it is really, really important for me in terms of seeing what volunteers want and need early on and actually getting that understanding of who's volunteering and not specifically, but groups of people, what is your demographic, where are they coming from? So that actually you 
have those conversations and that sort of for me has always helped later down the line in terms of knowing what to expect as well yeah 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 brilliant mate that's a it's a really good insight the the on the ground making sure people are working together for knowledge sharing and you, you touched on there about the 60 40 number i'm interested in your opinion on retention as a success factor how much weight do you put on retention so traditionally with events that happen again and again, yes, I do do a lot of one-off events. And the difference with one-off events is very much they're there once, make it a good experience, and then find the opportunities that they can go into afterwards. I think that's part that sometimes get missed in terms of I will always build a volunteer program and look at the bit after – I hate the L word. I hate the legacy word. It's one that's banded around so much. And so I'm guilty times. of it, mate. You'll be sick of me talking about um, it. So, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> no, but the reason is I hate that just for the main reason being in terms of what sort of expectation it builds up. Yeah, I yeah, very much sure. will go with where's the out route from a volunteer program? And that yeah, might sure. be that the event happens next year. But actually, for me and the work I've done in the past, especially working as part of a city council for so long and looking at a community aspect as well is can we transition people back into community sport for example through that remit so triathlon mm-hmm. has a go try for example athletics can we put people back into athletics clubs boxing can they volunteer at a boxing club but actually have we got that buy-in because as part of every event there's always that community remit there's always that element one way or the other in terms of how do we engage community aspects you know but actually where do they go afterwards so it's great that we can retain people and we can look at people and I can look at my sign-ups for the triathlon in 2021 versus 2019 and go, right, how many people have we still got? And yes, we want some of the experience. But actually, if I'm getting new people in and still hitting the numbers that I need, that for me is a good thing because we're engaging with a wider audience. Mm-hmm. I'd start to question if we missed a lot of people. Okay, is there something we're doing wrong in recruitment or marketing or actually what the event is now offering? and probably look at that but it's not a major red flag for me to start with if it becomes one i think we do need to know when and how to pick it up but i think opportunity needs to be available for everybody and i very much fall into that category of just because you've done something for the past five years doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have to do it for a sixth year try and do something different think about the variety aspect and that's sort of how i sort of the mantra i work with over sort of the the range of things i do Mm, really interesting lots of different conversation about it on retention as a success factor or as something that you just maybe it's an outcome of a good program or maybe you just let people do what they want to do and hopefully they come back and obviously the answer is somewhere in between yeah i think that's a really good insight mate so mate number one tip for engaging with volunteers Number one tip for engaging with volunteers. A very good question. I think it's really, really important to understand very much so how important volunteers are to an event and the experience that they have. I think that's a big, big thing for me in terms of know actually what they have to offer and Mm. where they can add value rather than gap filling with people. It's actually where are they beneficial for both the event, but also for themselves to gain experience. Yeah, the, the, the balance between numbers on a spreadsheet and individuals and what they're going to get out of it. And not then, well, it's so great, this podcast, you've been so about what their experience is going to be on the event, but as well, yeah. like what they can bring to the event. It, it's it's yeah. such a, it's, you're looking at it in such a deeper way, perhaps, than Maybe many others do, where it's talking about just filling filling roles too. And it's an easy trap to fall into with mass workforce management when you need hundreds, thousands of volunteers to get into the trap of saying we just need holes filled, where a lot of what you're talking about is, is really that personal, both what can we give them and what can they give us, like their individual skill sets and experience. Yeah, very, very much so. You know, it's being open and honest with what that volunteer role or opportunity entails, but also yeah. allowing them to grow and develop within it. I think yeah. you have to be realistic with that. If you need a thousand people, two thousand people, it changes the dynamic of that. And you need of to course. understand where you can actually approach that in a way because there'll be loads of times that you can't. With a couple of hundred people, it's a lot easier to do. Of course. Yeah, makes sense. And then this is a tough question, but your best best worst saddest funniest moment in working with volunteers is there one that sort of really jumps out to you or proudest moment like is there one moment that really screams out to you can i have two and i say two because one's bad but one's good 
So mm -hmm. when we did World Athletics Championships, the indoors in 2018, it was when the UK had the beast from the east um, and the weather was horrific. Uh, yes. But yes. In, the, in the best mindset, we thought it's in an indoor arena. We'll plan for everything, but it's indoors. So on day three of that event, the um, roof in the arena above my volunteer centre actually started majorly leaking. There was a monsoon, I think was the term, because the snow on top of the roof had actually made the roof cave in. So um, wow. dealing with that always stands in my mind in terms of the sheer panic that appeared and then go, right, I'm just going to deal with this. But the volunteers actually were great, dealt with it fantastically, had to be relocated elsewhere. It wasn't a problem, just got on with it. And that really, really mm. helped the experience for me in terms of sort of seeing that and how it works. The actual sort of highlight for me in terms of the, not the disaster of, of snow is volunteer wise. So I've seen working at the city council, I've had a couple of volunteers with me since 2011 that have volunteered that I did do very, very light touch in 2011 at an event. Seeing a couple of them actually grow now into volunteers that put the confidence that they've developed through volunteering at events at arts events in the community sort of just always shows to me the benefit of putting yourself out there and giving up time to try something mm -hmm. because a lot of people like that and these two in a prime example fall into that category of weren't really sure about it thought i'd give it a go but actually then totally fell in love with it and now it's a major part of what they do and their personality so yeah. that always just sits with me in terms of give something a try because you never know how it's going to be or the benefit it could actually have. Spot on, mate. I've been thinking of asking this question the whole podcast, but I, I haven't been sure of how to ask it. I'm still not really sure. But the, Go on. <laughs> you mentioned, obviously, different demographics, right? They all have their own reasons for volunteering. But yeah. to you, why do people volunteer? Is there a overarching reason people volunteer i genuinely think it's the community aspect of it i think it is that personal engagement and throughout lockdown we've talked about this a couple of times through some of the sports i do but through some of the cultural work i do with engagement as well is how do we keep volunteers engaged in a virtual world and we talk about training online and we talk about zoom meetings and we talk about oh could we do a monthly quiz with volunteers etc and that's great and you get to see them. But volunteers like that community ethos in my mind. They like, especially at events, they like the camaraderie of coming together to deliver something that is deemed a major event, is a major thing to deliver, but it's the people. And that this comes back to what we talked about at the start. They like engagement with people. And that for me is the biggest thing. And I will always, and my ethos of work is you put the people first. And that's how I've always worked. And in any role that I do, it's put the people first. Think about why you're doing something and the benefit to them. Very good, mate. I, I, I would agree. Last question, mate. When you're sitting at Christmas lunch, uh, looking back on the year that was, this year may be different to most. What does success look like for you personally in the work that you do? I think that's a really interesting question. And I'll be very honest with you. I am probably one of the worst people in terms of reflection. Because yeah, once yeah. something's done, I'm literally the next thing go yep. or I'm working on three things at the same time. And I think that's one of the, not a disadvantage of being freelance, but the balance is important in terms of you're going to be working on multiple things at the same time. So sometimes you just don't actually go, well, let's think about what has happened and reflect on it. And prime examples for me of that is things that happen every year that I'll do a week's work on. I might not think about until I turn up the next year and go, oh yeah, what happened last year? So personally, one of my developments as it were is to actually once something's done is to sit down properly and think from my perspective what did I do well there and what could I develop especially mm -hmm. last year I look at getting through the start of 2020 was great busy and had a lot planned but actually everything came to a grinding halt as it did with everybody but getting through that and now seeing that light at the end of the tunnel is such a massive thing and Yes, there's still a massive, massive way to go and things will still change. But the fact that people are still putting buying into events now and things are starting to appear is just what we sort of hold on to now. That glimmer of hope is there. Mm, yeah, fantastic, mate. Well, you don't need to be modest because I'll take it for you. <laughs> you really are uh, an exception, mate. You, you've done an incredible job uh, in what you do so far. The work you do for volunteers is pretty incredible in the UK and around Europe. So uh, it's, it's been 
awesome having you on the podcast, Tom. And mate, all the best for those events you've got coming up next year. And no doubt there'll be plenty more. So all the best, Tom. A pleasure. Thank you very much. (laughs) Good on you, mate. Thanks again. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Engage Volunteer Podcast with Tom Bowkett. We hope you enjoyed it. If this is your first time listening, then welcome. Our podcast aims to highlight the ways in which organizations and individuals are engaging with their communities to connect them to events and causes they're passionate about, with new episodes released each Wednesday fortnight. The best way to support us is to click follow where you listen to your podcast and tell your friends about us. For our next episode, we are very lucky to be joined by Karina Sadler, Volunteer Resources Supervisor at City of Plano in America. In this episode of the podcast, we discuss the stigmas that exist when it comes to young volunteers and why they should be embraced as a force for change. We also discuss the important role that technology plays in engaging and retaining teen volunteers who are looking for new and meaningful ways to give back to their communities. We hope to catch you then.